Thank you, Ed. All right, can you all hear me okay? All right. Thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to share the word with you guys uh, today. Um, and I'm really thankful that uh, just the serendipity of the timing, you know, as uh, Ed and his family mourn the loss of their, pat- uh, their matriarch, their grandmother. And um, um, yeah, I can't, I can't believe it's been uh, 22 years, man. It's crazy, you know? And, and as he's recounting that, that meeting at, at Bob Evans, um, I, I realized how bad my memory is. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh yeah, that did happen. And man, like, we're, you know, we're approaching 50. It's crazy, 20 years. Can't believe how old we're getting. But, uh, but God is good and he's faithful and uh, thankful that our friendship has lasted all throughout these years. And even though I uh, spent some time away uh, for, in Korea, um, back here in the States now, it's good to be back. Um, but yeah, trying to get used to America again. You know, a lot has changed in the past uh, past eight years, and um, but it's it's good. You know, it's good to be back. Um, so Ed asked me to share um, on something that I've been working on for my graduate studies, um, which centers on law and grace. Okay, law and grace. Um, so after some prayer and thinking, um, I thought it would be good to hear one of Jesus's parables. Um, <clears throat> where he teaches us about uh, generosity, okay? Grace in terms of generosity. Now, this sermon, um, it might actually make you mad (laughs) because Jesus has a way of doing that. Um, So, uh, you know, you're meeting me for the first time, and so I I, I, I hope I don't make you mad, but (laughs) it could happen. Um, So so to start, let me throw out a, a rhetorical question, okay? So what is the origin of fairness, fairness, right? Um, where does fairness come from? Where does our desire for fairness come from? Um, it exists in everyone, right? And, and you know, anybody who's had children, you see it from the very early age, toddler stage. Um, I've read some some papers where they say it at 15 months. They're doing research and, and testing these little kids about fairness, right? So it's like it's there from the very earliest stages. Um, did a little bo- bit more digging and research. And people in the scientific world and psychological world, they don't really have much to say about the actual origin of it. You know, the most that they can come up with is that you know, there are evolutionary causes um, behind and how our species had to develop social compatibility and stuff like that. You know, okay, so maybe some of that is might be partially true, but really, if you go under that, what's the origin of that, right? You know, so upon reflection, and you you think about it, you think about it biblically, you think about it theologically. Fairness comes from our being created in the image of God. That's where it comes from, our being created in the image of God. Biblically, the word for fairness is justice. Okay, justice. Um, but justice is actually bigger. Justice is more macro level. Fairness it falls under justice. Um, but it's there, uh, it, built into how we were created in the image of God. It's kind of like love, right? Uh, where does love come from? You know, there, there's no, like, evolutionary way to, to, you know, explain that. It's one of our base elemental attributes to our humanity, okay? Um, so there are three modes in which we think about fairness in terms of consequence for our moral actions. Okay, three, three modes um, that we think about fairness in terms of the consequences for our moral actions. So first, there's fairness with regard to when you've done something wrong. Okay, so when you've done something wrong, what is fair? Punishment. Okay, um, but when you don't receive that punishment, the opposite of that fairness we call mercy. Right? Um, but then, secondly, uh, there is a fairness with regard to when you have done good, when you've done right. And that fairness we call reward. Okay? You, get, you get a reward for that. Um, and then, if you don't get a reward for that good and for that uh, rightness that you you uh, did, we say that's just injustice, you know. We we feel that. 
And there's a, there's a neutral kind of fairness uh, where you just simply get what you deserve. Okay? Um, and a break in that natural order where you receive good that you don't deserve. We call that grace. Okay, when I receive good that I don't deserve. And that's a little bit different from mercy. Um, mercy is where you don't receive punishment for the bad that you deserve. Okay? And so like the emotional reaction is, whew, that's a relief. Right? Um, but grace is receiving the good that you don't deserve. And so the emotional reaction is, what a surprise. Right? Okay, so it's, it's similar but a little bit different. So let me read to you our passage for today, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Okay? Um, starts like this. For the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is speaking, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning, let's say 6 a.m., okay? He goes out 6 a.m. to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed, agreed to pay those workers a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, 9 a.m., he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about the sixth hour, which is 12 o'clock noon, and then the ninth hour at 3 p.m., and he did the same thing. And at about the eleventh hour, which is 5 p.m., he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, which is 6 p.m., the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones who were hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour, which is one hour, they came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, 12 hours of work, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. What's your internal reaction here, right? When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last Worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Amen. Hard to say amen to that, isn't it? <laughs> oh. So just to recap this story a little bit, the owner of a vineyard goes out, five times in the story, throughout the day, to hire workers. To the first group, 6 a.m., he offers to pay, let's say, at all. Okay, perfect. There we go. All right. Okay, so just to recap the story. The owner, he goes out five times throughout the day, hire workers, to the first group. Okay. Um, 6 a.m. 
he offers to pay them $100 for the day. That's not, that's not too bad for a day's wage, right? $100, okay? Um, to the second group, 9 a.m., he offers to pay whatever is right. That's what he says, okay? To the third and fourth, he says the same. In the fifth group, the last group, he offers them. He doesn't even say anything. He doesn't offer them anything, actually, right? And the workers get paid in reverse order. And this is the key in telling, and this is, you know, very key in telling the story. So the ones um, who worked one hour, they get paid $100, okay? So that's pretty good. $100 an hour of work, that's pretty good wage, right? So you can imagine the reaction. Oh my goodness, you're giving me $100 just for one hour of work? You're so generous. Thank you. It can be assumed then that those who worked three, six, and nine hours got $100 as as well. It doesn't exactly say. But finally, those who worked first, they came to receive their wage and they naturally expected more. Instead, they only got what they agreed upon. They got what they deserved. Right? In accordance with the original agreement. Okay, so Jesus, he's so masterful here playing on our emotions. And and you might be feeling the emotions now, right? So their complaint is that the owner has made them, right? Um, So we work 12 hours, but making them equal to us. That's the complaint. You're making them equal to us. In other words, they felt that the owner was being unfair and not treating them as they deserved as compared to the one-hour workers, even though they agreed to $100 for the day. So what is the issue? What is the issue exactly? What's the problem? The problem is not with the fairness or the justice of the master. That's not the problem. The master is being fair. He did not violate fairness. He did not give them $50. That would be unfair. He gave them $100, exactly what he said. The problem is not with the workers who got hired later. They all seem to be happy, right, with with their payment. The problem is with the all-day workers. The problem is that they have a problem with the generosity of the master. They feel that because they did more work, they should get more pay, right? This is a no-brainer. This is the universal logic throughout the whole world. Everybody understands this. Everybody naturally feels it, right? Um, Communism, they tried to do away with it, but it it failed, right? Communism, their their manifesto, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which means some work more, some work harder, some work less, but everybody comes out equal, okay? And everybody receives the same. That's communism, but that's not normal. (laughs) That's not innate to our understanding of how life works. Okay, so these early workers, they are getting what they deserve, yet they're still complaining. Compared to those who work less, they feel like they deserve more, right? It's their perception of what they deserve. They can't stand the fact that those who worked less have now been made equal, as far as wages go, to themselves. They can't stand that. Another way of putting it is this. Okay, so I'm putting it kind of in their own words here. If they get paid $100 for doing one hour of work, then why should I work for 12 hours and get paid the same? Right? I might as well work for one hour. That's what's going on here. And if we're honest with ourselves, perhaps uh, something like this is what we might be thinking and feeling. Is there anyone who would not think this to themselves? Right? Perhaps, maybe. Maybe people who don't have a job might f- feel, not feel the same way as, as them. Or maybe, maybe the homeless, maybe. Maybe the desperate, maybe. Right? These are the least likely, likely to complain because they are in need. But they might complain too. Okay? It's just kind of in our, in our human nature. But behind all of this 
is a works mentality. A works mentality. If I am going to work my butt off, right? If I'm going to bear the burden of the work and the heat of the day, these are the words of the 12 hour workers. If I'm going to work my butt off for 12 hours, then I better get what I deserve, which is what? In their mind. Okay, well, before their mind. What they deserve is 100 because that's what they agreed on, right? And then, to these people, if you only work one hour, you better not get even close to what I get. What you deserve is one twelfth of my hundred dollars. So you deserve eight dollars and thirty three cents for your work. Right? Okay. If I only get what I deserve, then you should only get what you deserve. That's fair. Right? And how many of us feel that way? You don't have to raise your hand. Okay? Um, it's natural. If you get more than you deserve, then I too should get more than I deserve. That's fair. If you worked one hour and got $100, I worked 12 hours, I should get $1,200. Right? You get more than you deserve, I too should get more than I deserve. It's only fitting. Friends, this is the way of the law. This is the heart of the law. If I can't get extra portions, then you can't get extra portions. Right, let's go back to our childhood here. At the dinner table, maybe you see it in your own family now. Right? If I can't have fun, you can't have fun. It's the heart of legalism. And you can take it even one step further. Okay, this sounds like, not, I'm sure most of us don't think like this, but if they get to sin, I get to sin too. Right? That's fair. If they get to sin and they get to be forgiven for it, then I get to sin and I get to be forgiven for it too. Right? Okay, that's the heart of the legalist. There is no room for grace. There is no room for gifts. You can only get more than me if you worked harder than me. Tit for tat. Right? So the point of the story is not that one hour's work is worth the same as 12. That is not the point of the story, okay? Jesus is not trying to make an economical statement here, okay? Um, nor is the point that everybody gets the same reward. That is not it either. Rather, the point is that God is generous. God is generous and he is gracious to those who don't deserve it. And so the question is, this is the underlying question of the parable, is, can you handle that? Can you handle that? Can you handle that God is generous? All right, so go back to the sibling context. So this is often uh, difficult for older siblings. Not, not always, but sometimes. Can you handle the fact that your younger brother or sister seems to receive as much reward, as many gifts, as much praise and allowance as you do, particularly when they do less than you do? Can you handle that? Ah! Right? They are less responsible than you. They don't measure up as much as you do, but they get as much as you do from your parents. Can you handle that? That's hard. It's not fair, right? Does it eat, does it eat you up inside that your parents are generous to your younger siblings? Put it in the context of the church, okay? So I don't, I don't, this is not a statement about Restoration Church, but I've seen this in many churches, okay? Um, perhaps you are a good and moral person, okay? You are always abiding by the rules, and you're trying to please God with the actions of your life. Can you handle it when good things happen to people who clearly are not as good as you are? When their life gets blessed, when God uses them to bless other people, even other people in the church, and you're thinking to yourself, why does everybody like him or her? Why? Right? How come nobody recognizes what I do? And then God will sometimes use these, quote unquote, less deserving people to actually lead others in the church, to be a leader. Right? To be a deacon or what, you know, 
And so naturally it's like, what about me? I've been serving so long, I've been attending so faithfully, where's my promotion? Okay? So we do this in church, we do this in life, don't we? Back uh, in earlier years of ministry for me, um, there was a guy, I won't say his real name because this, this is being recorded, this is live. I'll call him Morris. His name is nothing like Morris at all. Um, I barely know a single Morris. But, um, so me and Morris, we were partners in ministry, um, and he was always late. He was always late, and I was always on time. Okay, And I thought to myself, because I'm on time, I'm showing that I'm committed, and I deserve respect for that. Right? However, because Morris was always late, I thought it showed that he was uncommitted, and that he was not as credible as a pastor because of that. And yet, everybody loved him. I mean, they adored this guy. Right? So I couldn't stand the fact that everybody loved him and respected him for his preaching, his teaching, his pastoring, and it's not that people didn't respect me, right? I had respect too, but I wanted them to respect and love me more, right? Because I did a better job at being on time and showing that I was more committed, quote unquote, right? When it comes to receiving our reward, our, our blessings and our gifts, it is not about justice and fairness. It's not as if we earned it, right? It is about grace. It is about getting what we don't deserve. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Getting what you don't deserve. If you expect and if you demand reward from God for the things that you have done, then you'll get exactly what you deserve, right? Because you're operating then on a contractual basis. It's a contract with God. I do this much for you, God. You pay me this. Right? But then you have to understand, if you're going to work like this, you have to go by those rules right, of the contract paradigm. And you have to accept the negative side as well. And the negative side is, if I do this much against you, <laughs> right, then you pay me back in punishment as well. Do you really want that? Do you really want that? You know? Do you want to live by the rules of this paradigm, particularly with God? Because at this point, you not only disqualify yourself from grace, you disqualify yourself from mercy as well. <laughs> you don't want to go there, right? It's not a very good system, but it is fair. It's fair. That's the law. However, if you don't expect, if you don't demand much at all from God for the things that you've done, you'll end up getting much more than you think you deserve. Then at this point, it is no longer a contractual kind of agreement. Rather, it's on the basis of grace and generosity. And this is what God extends to us. This is what he offers to us. And can you accept that? Right? Not only for yourself, but for others as well. It's a recognition wherein we say to God, Lord, I know I don't deserve much from you. I'm just glad to be a part of your family. Even more so, I want to grow in this understanding that I am always with you and that everything you have is mine. Have you guys heard that before? It comes from the story of the prodigal son, right? where the father says to the older son, and the older son's been complaining about his younger brother who squandered all the money and all the wealth. The father says to the older son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. That's just a wonderful statement, right, that talks about and reflects the generosity of our God. God's great gifts are distributed not because they are earned, but because he is generous. You don't get reward from God because you deserved it. You get reward from God because he's kind. Right? God works off of a completely different paradigm, a different set of quote-unquote rules, if you will. 
And so if you find yourself asking the question, well then, why should I waste my time working for 12 hours? Why not just work one hour? Right? If you find yourself asking that question, it is very much like the other question I asked earlier. If they get to sin and be forgiven, why don't I get to sin and be forgiven? It, it's, it's, it's the same, essentially. And if that's what we're asking, then we've completely missed the point. Right? This is not a parable about whether or not I should work. It's not a parable of how much I should work. This is a parable about God inviting us to a purposeful, meaningful life in serving Him and His kingdom. And then, on top of that, receiving a gracious reward on the basis of His goodness and not on the basis of our hard work. Friends, it takes a lot of time to adjust to this. It takes a lot of time to adjust to this mentality because our world is all about fairness. You know, all the way from infant stage. It's all about fairness. Our sense of justice. It's our sense of justice. It's not necessarily biblical justice. It's our sense of what is right and wrong. And because we are immersed in this world of fairness, it is hard to adjust to the world of grace. Right? Because no one could have told this story. Nobody. Only Jesus could have told this story because he's on a totally different wavelength. Right? It's hard to adjust to the world of grace. We're glad to receive grace, but it's hard to live it, and it's hard to show it to others. It takes a lot of adjustment. Now, it's interesting that this parable is preceded by the famous story of the rich young man meeting Jesus in chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. So, brief recap of this story. The rich young man, he asked Jesus what he needs to get what he needs to do to get eternal life. And Jesus tells him, well, you need to obey the commandments, right? And so he says, oh, I've done all that, right? What do I still lack? Jesus tells him, go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor. What? It's like, what? <laughs> you know? And so he walks away sad because he had great wealth, meaning he didn't want to give away any of his possessions. From his perspective... They were his possessions. They were his own, right? That he earned. Thus, Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What, be, what Jesus is saying, basically, is that it's impossible. <laughs> and so the disciples ask, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, with man, with human, humanity, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible, meaning he can save. Right? God is the one who can lead people to a transformed heart if they're willing. God can do that. But why wasn't this rich young man's heart transformed? Why wasn't he willing? Okay? And here's the connection. He wasn't willing because he lived his life based on the paradigm of getting and retaining what he thinks he deserves just like the first workers in our parable. What they shared in common was the mentality of mine. It's mine. I should get what I earned. I deserve it, and I should be able to keep what I earned. Why should I share it? It's mine. They don't have a generous spirit. Because they believe that money and possessions are the result purely of their own effort. And this is so easy for us to fall into, right? They don't recognize that everything they have is because of God's grace. Everything. Okay? So Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verses 17 to 18, uh, reinforces this. The book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt, and they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're about to go into the promised land. And so God is giving them all this instruction for how you are to go in, what, men what mentality, um, you know, all of it, right? So here's what he says. When you're inside, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore 
to your ancestors as it is today. Right? God gives us that ability. It's not, it's not us. And so this is what kills generosity. The mentality of mine. Mine, mine, mine. Which is rooted in getting what I think I deserve. And this comes from the underlying false belief that this world is all there is. If you think this world is all there is, then you better get yours. Because there's nothing else coming. Right? But that's a false belief. We don't believe that, right? As believers, as Christians, right? But that belief is what we call practical atheism. Practical atheism. It's atheism in practice, right? So as believers, we can actually fall into this, right? We know God exists. We come to Sunday, we worship Him. We, it's true, we believe it, but we don't always live like He's the master of the universe. <laughs> we, don't, we don't live like that. I, I gotta, I gotta scrounge. I gotta keep what's mine. Right? We know that there's a thing called eternal life, but we live like this life is all there is, and so I need to hold on to my possessions. I need to hold on to my earnings, or else I won't have enough. And if this is how we think, then there's no room to be gracious. There's no room to be generous because I can only think of myself. So let me just juxtapose this Jesus encounter with another Jesus encounter. So Zacchaeus, you guys know this story, right? Zacchaeus in uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, I'll just briefly go over this. He was also very rich, uh, but as a tax collector, he made his money off, uh, off of robbing his own fellow Israelites by charging them more than they needed to pay for Roman taxes and then pocketing the extra for himself. That's how he made his money. And so Jesus walks into his town, and he notices that Zacchaeus is hiding in a tree, and, and Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he doesn't want other people to notice him. And so Jesus calls him out, and then Jesus invites himself over to his house, okay? Um, which was a huge privilege and a huge honor for Zacchaeus, since Jesus was very popular, not to mention he was the Messiah, like the Son of God, right? Um, so... This is an act of grace. It's an act of grace, giving Zacchaeus what he doesn't deserve, which is what? What does Zacchaeus not deserve that he's receiving here? Friendship. Friendship and acceptance with God. Right? Zacchaeus did not see this as something he deserved or something that he was entitled to because he had money. He knew that everybody hated him, and yet Jesus loved him. It's crazy, right? And so in response to this amazing grace, in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to, to, to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Whoa! That's crazy, Right? What transformed Zacchaeus' heart and made him so generous? Right? The answer is grace. Grace is what changes us. Greatly has he been forgiven, greatly does he give. In comparison to the first workers of our story, right, of this parable, who could only think of what they're entitled to. Zacchaeus was transformed into the same generosity as the owner of the vineyard who paid workers more than they deserved. In comparison to the rich young man who would not give any of his possessions even though Jesus invited him to, Zacchaeus gave half of his possessions and paid back all those he cheated four times the amount. So much, right? Money, possessions, Entitlement and earnings no longer had a hold on Zacchaeus. Jesus did. Right? And that was enough for him. When we truly receive and live in the grace of God, then with joy, we give generously. We give of our tithes and our offerings, our time and our energy. It just generously flows. 
because we have received such grace from our God and because we know that this gracious God is limitless in his resources for his children. He's limitless in his resources for his children. Friends, the kingdom of God is not about what you deserve because of your good works or what others don't deserve because they didn't do good enough. The kingdom of God is an invitation to life. It is an invitation to grace. And when we really understand this and embrace this, then not only will we be happier and more content, we will also become gracious people, like the generous landowner, like Zacchaeus. If we don't understand and embrace this grace, then life will only be fair. Life will only be fair. Life with God will be a contract. No surprises, no gifts, only what you deserve. <laughs> do, you, do you want that? Anybody want that? No, right? It's one or the other. It is the world of fairness, which is law, or the world of grace. It's one or the other, right? Paul says this in Romans 6, 14. You are no longer under law, but under grace. And so which one do we want? In my opinion, this kind of fairness, this kind of law life, right? It's not life. It's labor. It's contract. Unfortunately, many people think this is what Christianity is. It's unfortunate. Um, but they think this both inside the church and outside the church. And this is in part why people outside the church reject God and reject the church. They already experience contract in the world. So why should they come to church and experience the same thing? Right? And this is all because they have a wrong view of God, both inside and outside the church. And this is why many in the church are not being transformed because we think it's a contract. Even if we don't conceptually think like it's a contract, we often live like it's a contract, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we live like it's a contract. I do this for you, God, and you do this for me. And if that's how we're living deep down, that's what we believe. And if that's the way it is for us, then we're not going to see transformation in our lives. Because then all of this is just behavior modification. That's all it is. Modify your behavior, right? And try to look like a Christian. <laughs> like, is that what we believe? Not at all, right? Who wants that? There's no life in that. So friends... Receive the grace of God. Receive it. It is a learning curve. And if you feel like you don't fully get it, you don't feel, if you feel like you don't fully understand it, pray for it. Enter into that world of grace. Okay? And mull over and kind of chew on this passage. Lord, why are you so generous? Like, chew on that. And then, why do I not want to be? <laughs> And chew on that. Okay? And then for some of us who are generous, because I'm, I know that, that there are people who are, who are generous, if you find yourself judging people who aren't generous, why do you judge? Right? That's not very generous. So it's all these layers, right? Oh, we got to wrestle with it. The Lord in His mercy and His grace he extends his generosity to all, to everyone. How does he extend his generosity? You know this. By giving everything he has, his life, for us. The Father gives his Son. The Son gives his life on the cross to take on the death that we deserve. What is that? It's mercy. It's the relief. You took on my death. Thank you. My punishment. Thank you. That's relief. Mercy. In order to receive his life. 
right? There's an exchange that goes on. In exchange, we get his life and we get his righteousness, which is more than I deserve. And that's his grace. Surprise! Wow! I get this too? Not only do I not die, not only do I not experience eternal punishment, but I get fullness of life and I get your righteousness? Wow! Thank you so much. Mercy and grace. Right? None of us ever deserved it, and to this day, we still don't. Whether you've been a Christian for two days or for 20 years, whether you're an adulterer or murderer or a teacher of children or an elder in the church, whatever you are, you never deserved it. None of us. We still don't. So don't fall into that trap thinking that you do. That is the world of contract. No life there. Enter the world of grace. Don't deserve it. Don't deserve it. Instead, receive it. And thank him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. So probably uh, about the message, maybe different points have hit you already. Um, let's just kind of chew on that, mull on that a little bit. Maybe for a while we've been holding on to a wrong view of God. And and it's not necessarily because of, of our church upbringing, but it's just the way of the world. It's so deeply ingrained in us that we have known no other way. Maybe we have understood that, oh yeah, I've been saved by grace. I, I, I received my salvation. I, I was converted and I was, uh, yeah, I, I experienced that grace of God initially but after that, maybe we return to the world of law. Where it's now contract. And so Lord, how do we how do I how do I continue in your grace? How do I how do I become more like you in your generosity? You think in a totally different way than I'm used to, Lord. Help me to think the way you do. Reshape my values, God. And so, Lord, we come to you, and as we pray and as we sing these songs of worship, Lord, help us to to see with new eyes, to see with renewed eyes, to see this world of grace that you have delivered us into, that you have invited us into, this, this world of grace that you actually created us for. May we revel in your generosity and your kindness extended to us, God. And as we, as we swim in that, in your grace, may we be transformed to become gracious and generous like you. In Jesus' name, amen.